few weeks ago, as I was shopping uh, for uh, Shabbat, I saw a neighbor, uh, Rabbi Moshe Tzvi Laufer, who I knew had recently uh, published a Hebrew edition of the memoir he wrote of his family's experience uh, surviving the Holocaust uh, in uh, having come from Rotterdam in Holland where approximately 20% of the population uh, survived. He, uh, so I asked, is it out? And he said, yes, it's out. He said, Nisim, Nisim, Nisim. Miracles, miracles, miracles. That was his summary. And that's a lead in then to uh, my endeavor today to uh, try to strike a balance in the critical perception of testimony. For the most part, uh, criticism on testimony has been guided by a certain attempt to purge the critical idiom of religious language in general and miracles in particular. And I quote one very uh, influential version of that. Eventually, says a prominent researcher, Lawrence Langer, eventually we must learn to suspect bracing pieties like redeeming and salvation when they're used to shape our understanding of the ordeal of former victims of Nazi oppression. End of quote. So what I would like to then suggest is that a focus on testimonies shows that miracles, the rhetoric of miracles, the reference to miracles, if not ubiquitous, is a regular feature of Holocaust testimony. And that uh, can be found not only in ultra-Orthodox, or even Orthodox, but a wide range. And that this attempt to purge our vocabulary limits our ability to describe accurately what's said and meant and I re recommend, which my paper is a, a small contribution toward, expanding our vocabulary to enfold miracles and the language that they grow out of more generally. I first, though, want to, a couple of just short preliminary comments. Of course, thanks to Miriam to Boaz for their hosting of this conference in such a special way. There is no other invitational conference that I know of, much, to, much less a open conference, where the organizers host the invitees at their own homes for a meal and allow them to have an entry into their, their lives in such a intimate and uh, caring way. And it really uh, sh shows the, and colors in such a positive way, the texture of the entire conference. So thank you. <laughs> second, second, I always like when giving a talk to set it not only in place in Israel with our fine hosts here, but also in time. And today is the, Mouse? What did I do? Move, no, move the mouse. Move the mouse. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, it didn't even squeal, and I they it's moved the mouse. You know that. It's a miracle. So, <laughs> um, so in time, today is the twenty uh, seventh of March in the Gregorian calendar of the year two thousand fourteen, but in the Jewish calendar, which is also a very regular part of Israeli and Jewish life. It's the 25th day of what's called Adar Sheni, the second month of Adar, in the year uh, 5774. That date has a particular reference to this conference, because two years ago, we sat at the hotel and unfortunately heard the news 
that there was a shooting in Toulouse, France, on this day, where Rabbi Jonathan Sandler, his two children, Arie and Gabriel, and Miriam uh, Mansonigo were murdered. And our conference, which was trying to seek a language to be able to talk about catastrophe and terror, was imploded with that sense of the resolve to move forward. So today is the yard site, it's the Yom Zikaron of those who lost their lives. I want to, in a simple gesture, dedicate whatever might be significant in, in or just the, the intention to honor their memory through uh, my, uh, my words today. Miracle, we can say in a very uh, elementary definition, refers to supernatural intervention bringing about some positive result. Supernatural intervention bringing about some positive result. What took place could not have occurred through the course of natural events only. And miracles we find, just as a very brief backdrop, we find in the Torah, Jewish scriptures, we find a plethora of miracles referred to and discussed in the Talmud, the holidays in the Jewish calendar, and here I'm speaking about particularly a Jewish notion of miracle, though I know it's not limited to Jewish experience. Um, holidays in the Jewish calendar are always virtually linked with miracles. Um, two holidays in particular, Hanukkah and Purim, have a blessing that goes along with that holiday, Shasan Nisim Lavo Senu, made the, for the miracles that the Almighty did for our forefathers in their time. And, um, and we have a blessing uh, that is uh, there with us today that's one of the facets of miracles, that when one, for example, goes to a place where miracles have been done for the Jewish people in the past or has been done for an individual, there is a blessing to be said um, to give thanks for that miracle. So the, the texture of miracles is very much a, a part of religious Jewish culture and Jewish culture, I would suggest, um, generally. Um, one of the testimonies I want to feature today is a testimony written in Yiddish by Rabbi um, Meir uh, Yuzhent. Rabbi Meir Yuzhent was born in Lithuania outside of Kovna um, in 1924. Uh, he learned at the Slobodka Shiva, a very famous yeshiva outside of, in the area of Kovna, and he was able to survive the war through many ordeals. He wrote a memoir in Yiddish, which he never published in Yiddish, but that was translated and I helped to edit uh, two years ago. And the title is Chain of Miracles. And uh, Rabbi Yushin says, in terms of that name, I call this book The Chain of Miracles because from the first day that I lost my dear parents, brother, and sister, from the minute that I was imprisoned in the cruel cage that the murders built for me, the Almighty forged a chain of miracles enabling me to come out unscathed from their contemptible bloody hands." End of quote. And we see it's already intimated that this focus on miracles does not mean to I, 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 uh, to uh, uh, jettison or leave out the reference to the terrible events that were suffered. But the miracles are nonetheless woven into that language. Rabbi Yushin, as he goes on, actually refers to uh, a definition of miracle in, uh, in his own way. He has three different miracles. Um, one, the first, that which is enveloped in nature, meaning when one wakes up, 
um, that itself is a miracle, but it's enveloped in a natural way so we don't see it. Two, those that are transparent, where the, 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 the miracle is visible to all who experience it. And three, those that were shrouded in some kind of other lucky event. He mentions um, getting an airplane ticket, um, then uh, missing the plane, and the plane ends up crashing. And so, one, that's a miracle, but it's shrouded. And we know there's a famous story about such miracles where a person is uh, Nebach in a flood, and he's on top of his house, and uh, the, uh, as the, the flood is there, someone climbs up and tries to uh, save him. He says, no, no, the, the Lord will take care of me. Then a boat comes along and says, please hop in. He says, no, no, uh, uh, the, the Lord will save me. Finally, a helicopter is sent, and he says, no, no, the Lord will save me, and the flood gets higher, and he's not saved. So when he goes to the next world, he says, Lord, I'm such a good, you know, such a good believer, and where were you? Why didn't you come save me? So the Lord says, who do you think sent the man, and who sent the boat, and who sent the helicopter? So this way of being shrouded in nature is Rabbi Yushin's um, way of talking about uh, miracles. And we'll come back to the way in which he finds the language to fuse the miraculous as well as the graphic sense of loss. The inventory on, of miracles includes those um, that refer to being saved from discovery, from capture, from death, having the energy to persevere, to recover after illness, the return of a loved one, resistance, and hope, all of which are then included as aspects of the miraculous. And that miraculous is there already from the time of the war in a, a very special diary that's soon to be published by Rabbi Chaim Yitzhak Vogelanter, a Polish chosid that kept a diary during the war. He was born in 1911, um, was murdered by Polish militia in 1944, but his diary was saved. He talks about, as they're in hiding, as we lie on the straw, we again consider the great miracle we have experienced and thank God that we have suffered only fear. And then again, let us thank and praise God that we are here. Mother is still laid up in Sipau with her broken arm. Even with all that, we experienced many miracles. So the language of miracle, certainly within the war itself, one can find in a, a range of diaries um, and other writings from that time. Um, the further step that I also want to suggest is that in some testimony, there is an idea that miracles are the driving force behind the testimony. One is testifying to publicize the miracle, which is, has a larger uh, conceptual background in religious Jewish life, but for now it's the, the very act of testimony is predicated on publicizing the miracle. So one uh, very uh, dramatic in instance of this comes from Rabbi Yitzhak Yaakov Weiss, also known as the, the Minchas Yitzhak, um, who um, was uh, born in 1902 in Romania, um, and passed away in 1989. So Rabbi Yitzhak Yaakov Weiss writes when talking about publicizing the miracle, I hereby prepare myself, this is the very beginning of his testimony, his memoir, I hereby prepare myself to extol my creator with blessings of thanksgiving to the awesome one for the miracles he performed on our behalf. No book would be big enough to detail all that we endured for the Holy One, blessed be he, saved us from the accursed enemy countless times when we were a hair's breadth away from death. Nevertheless, I am obliged to write in order to publicize the miracle.
End of quote. This language of miracle, as I suggested before, can be found not only in these words of great sages and rabbis, but in more uh, uh, non-religious, secular uh, uh, writers. For example, Shimon Lax, who was a violinist in the orchestra at Auschwitz, uh, born in 1901, uh, uh, writes uh, that his survival came is a miracle in a long series of miracles that kept me alive. End of quote. Or Benjamin Jacobs, who was referred to in the title of his memoir, is the dentist in Auschwitz, talks about that he and his father survived through three miracles and details those. And Saul Cooper, uh, Saul Cooper on after the war, memories often resurfaced in sweat-soaked nightmares. Many of these concerned all the little incidents that together led to my miraculous survival. As I've mentioned before, this chronicling, this rhetoric, this use of miracle does not mean that losses are not uh, faced head on. Um, so that Rabbi Yushin, for example, in the, in toward the beginning of his memoir, his, and I, I just have to say, I don't want to select, excerpt the most um, the most uh, graphic sections. But this was the hardest, hardest memoir I've ever, ever read or ever heard. The following miracle happened to me on the way back to the city when my friends and I were already two kilometers from Sobotka. Suddenly a gang of Lithuanians attacked us with spears and knives. With coarse voices, they asked where we were coming from. Their eyes fell upon an old woman lying in a wagon, too weak to stand up. We had paid a good deal of money to rent this wagon from a Lithuanian farmer who agreed to transport a Jewish woman. The woman's daughter was walking beside the wagon. The Lithuanians attacked the old woman, threw her to the ground, kicked her in her face so that she died immediately. To the farmer who owned the wagon, they shouted, just you wait, we'll punish you for transporting a Jewish woman. When the daughter saw her mother laying on the ground, no longer breathing, she dropped down to her and began screaming, Mama, Mama, don't leave me in the world. The horses strained at their bridles when they heard this woeful weeping. But the Lithuanians cold-bloodedly stabbed both the mother and the daughter with their spears. The two devoted ones were thus not separated. Mother and daughter took their last breath together, and the daughter was not left alone in this world. End of quote. The, um, the absence of miracle is also noted in the, um, in the litany that brings um, miracles to bear. So Rabbi Joseph Pollock, whose memoir is soon to come out, talks about that he owes his survival to the many miracles that brought him as a two-year-old through Vesterbork and Bergen-Belsen. But he also does not want to get, though, forget those million and a half children who perished unattended, this is his language, unattended by miracles. The, um, the, uh, as time is short here, that I'll want to uh, then conclude um, with this review and looking, saying very briefly uh, that why I think the language of miracles has been skirted is A, history is not concerned generally with the miraculous, but with causal explanation. So the miraculous seems uh, superfluous, and so testimony is then, which brings the miraculous, is also seen to be superfluous. And according to others, that the focus on, as we heard earlier, religious language and miracle blocks the access to the reality through these bracing pieties. And how would we benefit from including them? 
We would be more inclusive in our integration of testimonies. It would make dealing with testimonies more complicated. It would be more accurate, faithful, with a pun on that word, reflection of the idiom used within testimony. And to finish, I want to return to Rabbi Moshe Tzvi Laufer's uh, describing his parents and family's ordeal as Nisim, Nisim, Nisim. The use of three, as uh, Boaz had mentioned earlier, in Jewish life has a sense that something is fixed, is embedded. But three is also, I think, here subjectively important because his mother survived Ravensbrück and Bergen-Belsen with three children under the age of six years old. And so those Nisim, miracle, Nisim, miracle, Nisim, miracle, I think could be subconsciously, of course, but that each reference to the miracle is for the life of one child who was preserved. Thank you very much.